Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Before we look at our text, I would like to say that I always enjoy it when I'm able to be in a place and gathered with God's people and also to worship God unhindered when um, I believe that the young people leading us in worship have done an excellent job of drawing attention to the Lord and not to themselves. And uh, it's always a great blessing. Just to give you a lesson on worship, you, you, did, you did wonderful. But um, I always say leading worship is like a man walking down the street in New York where the sidewalk is just filled with people. Imagine that man walking down the sidewalk. No one's paying attention to him. But all of a sudden he stops and just looks up. He keeps looking up. What's everyone going to do? As they walk down the sidewalk, they're going to look at him, and then they're going to go like this. <laughs> That's how you lead worship. That you are so enthralled with worshiping God that when the congregation looks at you, they quickly remove their eyes from you to look at what you're looking at. You guys did a good job of that. Uh, Romans chapter 3. Now, I made something of a commitment years ago that no matter where I went in the world, I would preach this text. That the first thing I would always do whenever I came to a place is preach this text in Romans 3. And um, I've been consistent, preached it in a lot of places. Because I do believe it is the most important text in all the Scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting, it is excluded by what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. Now we're going to look at this text line by line and draw some truths that are not common in gospel preaching today. But if you went back 150 years and farther, you would find it on, in every sermon. In every sermon on the gospel. Let's begin. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that means so little today, doesn't it? Does it fill your heart with fear and trembling? to think that this is speaking about you. Do you fear sin? Do you hate it? Do you see, see it as something of just abject disgust? We walk out in the world today and we tell someone they're a sinner, they're liable to laugh at us, aren't they? Not because they don't believe it's true, just because they don't care. You tell a man he has sinned, he really doesn't care. Our society lives on sin. It drinks down iniquity like it was water. We use sin in advertising, in comedy, in entertainment, in everything. So to tell someone that they are a sinner means very little. And why is it that sin is taken so lightly? I will explain it this way. Because people do not know God. You do not press upon someone the magnitude of what sin is merely by talking about sin or the damage sin does to the person or society or culture or generational effect of sin. That means very little. The only way someone is going to understand how horrific sin truly is is to understand the glory of the God against whom it is committed. And since so little preaching today has to do with the magnificent and majesty of God. Since so much preaching today is humanistic 
and man-centered and all about man. People do not fear sin because they do not fear God and they do not fear God because they don't know God and they don't know God because most preachers aren't preaching God and most preachers don't preach God because they don't know God. And so we see the train, don't we? What is the thing that the church most needs to know? Who God is. Let me give you an example. If you and I are playing American football or rugby or soccer, and you get a little rough with me, and I jokingly say to you, hey buddy, you do that one more time, I'm taking you out of this world. Okay? I can say that to you, and we can laugh about it. But if I say that to President Barack Obama, I'm going to go to jail. No, really. You don't make statements like that about the president. You don't. Why? Because of his authority. Because of his position as president. It's not treated the same way. And it should not be treated the same way. Now, taking that example, let's think about the person of God. Sin is horrific because of the glory of the one against whom it is committed. The Puritans used to say this, when you sin, you've not sinned against some small mayor of a tiny village, but you have sinned against the Lord of glory. All of heaven declares that you rightfully ought to die for the most minor infraction against God. Yet we don't see that because in our world, man is so big, he's the measure of all things, he's the center of all things, and God is so small. So the only way we're going to be able to regain our idea of the sinfulness of sin is to first regain the glory of God. God rebukes Israel in the book of Psalms and says this, you committed all these things, you committed all these sins because you thought I was like you. Do you know that Sunday morning is the greatest hour of idolatry in the Western world? It is. Do you know why I say that? Because if you were to go into most churches and ask people to describe the God they're worshiping, you would discover it's not the God of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I've had pastors come to me and say, I'd like you to do a week-long conference in our church on the attributes of God. And I say, that's a little dangerous, don't you think? And they go, why would you say that? I say, Pastor, if I start teaching, not my personal view of God, but if I taught in your church the classical, historical view of the attributes of God, when I got to the sovereignty, justice, and righteousness and wrath of God, you would have some of your church members stand up and say, that's not my God. I could never love a God like that. Most people have almost no sense whatsoever of who God is. No biblical sense. And so what do they do? They create a God in their own image and then they worship the God they've made. A God like us. But He's not like us. All have sinned. I like to put it this way. Imagine that on the day of creation, God tells stars to put themselves in certain parcels in space and they all bow down and they worship Him. He tells planets to move in certain orbits and not to leave their rhythm and they all cry out, Amen. He tells mountains to be lifted up and valleys to be cast down, and they obey Him. He tells the sea, you will come to this point and you will come no further, and the sea worships. And then He looks at you and says, come, and you go, no. That's why on the day of judgment, all of creation will praise God for His condemnation of you if you are outside of Christ. And they will raise their hands and testify that the God of all the earth has judged you rightly. We have no idea how small and pathetic we are and how great and magnificent He is. 
all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When you study the history of Bible interpretation on this passage right here, on that phrase, fall short of the glory of God, you will be absolutely astounded. Why? It has become so man-centered. The idea today is you've fallen short of the glory of God. God had a wonderful plan for your life and you, you're missing it. And that's why you're not self-fulfilled and self-realized and self-everything else. That's not what the text means. This is not about you. When it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the proper interpretation, the historical interpretation, the one in the context of Romans itself is this. What it's saying is this. Although you knew God, you did not honor Him as God or give thanks. That God made you for His glory. Not your self-fulfillment. God made you for His glory and you are not serving that purpose. You have sinned. Do you see? That's what the text is about. Man is dislocated and disfigured. Seeking to be something he was never created to be. To the ruin of his own life. To the jeopardy of his own peace. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You and I are only whole when we see God above ourselves and we worship and serve God rather than our own puny purposes. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This presents the greatest problem. As a matter of fact, man only has one problem. It's sin. And why is sin a problem? Not because of sin itself, actually. Sin is a problem because of God. As a matter of fact, man's greatest problem is God Himself. You see, sin would not be a problem at all if God was like us. Sin would not be a problem at all if God were not righteous or holy. But He is righteous and holy, and therefore sin presents a great problem. I was to teach at a university for a night to a conference of basically atheistic, agnostic, a large crowd of people who were contrary to the Gospel. And as I'm behind the curtain waiting to be introduced, I'm sitting there going, Lord, what do I do? I mean, I don't mind going out there and be booed and heckled and everything else, but I desperately want to make these people see the reality of the Gospel. Now, as I was walking towards the microphone, just something all of a sudden just came into my head. And so I said it. I said tonight, before I get started, I would like to warn most of you that for some of you, at least the faint of heart, you may want to just simply leave now. Because what I am going to do is tell you the most terrifying truth for the thinking man, the most terrifying truth in Scripture. If you want to know the most frightful thing a man can conceive, I'm going to share it with you tonight. And therefore, I forewarn you that you may want to leave. I had their attention. And so they're leaning forward, waiting. What is this horrific thing that the preacher is going to tell us? And so I said, here it is. For the thinking man, the most horrific, terrifying truth is this. God is good. I could see them kind of sit there and then I saw them smirk. And then one of the students goes, what's the problem with that? And I said, you're not good. So now what does a good God do with someone like you? And that is the great problem. Do you realize in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the last judgment, the last judgment, the final judgment, comes before the ushering in of the new creation. Do you know why? God must rid creation of some of you before He can create a new creation because you would defile it. You must be cast out of, to a place where there is no place found for you because if you even touched the new creation... 
you would bring it into disarray just like the first. He must ruin you in order to save the new creation. What is a good God to do with violators, twisted, perverted souls who love evil and hate good? What is a God to do? This was common food in preaching just a hundred years ago. It's hardly mentioned today. You see, here's the thing you need to understand. God is righteous. And because He is righteous, He must judge. You must understand also God is love. And because God is love, He must hate. A woman one time objected to one of my sermons and she stood up and she said, God can't hate because He's love. And I said, no, God is love, therefore He must hate. What do you mean? Do you love Jews? Yes? Well, then you cannot be dispassionate or neutral about the Holocaust. You must hate the Holocaust. Do you love African Americans? Yes? Then you must hate slavery. You see, if you are truly, truly righteous, and if you truly love all that is good, all that is pure, all that is beauty, all that is life, then you must hate certain things. And it's amazing that we reserve that right for ourselves, but we refuse to say God has that right. Let me give an example. If you were to open up the newspaper tomorrow and read about a little boy, that when he was five years old, he was kidnapped and carried away to a dark basement of a vile man where for ten years he was tortured. And the very day that they found him, the authorities, was the day he died. Having suffered years and years of torment at the hands of that vile man. When you read that, and I said, how do you feel about that? If you said to me, well, you know, it's no big deal. I mean, people need to have the freedom that they, you know, freedom to do what they feel like they need to do. What about that boy? Well, you know, if you said something like that, I'd realize that you were just as vile as the man who tortured him. If you could be neutral and without passion in the face of such evil, you are vile. If the Holocaust in Auschwitz does not bother you, you are an immoral person. Do you understand me? The right response to that is what? Righteous indignation. Where your reason has to literally subject your zeal for what is right or you're going to go out and murder that man for what he has done. We have a righteous indignation. If we being evil can burn when we hear about the injustices in this world, how much more a perfectly holy God Many of you have heard the statement, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. Well, I'm sorry to inform you that that's not a biblical statement. It's not. God hates the sinner. Turn to Psalms chapter 5. Hold your place in Romans. Psalms chapter 5, verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Look what it says. Does it say that God hates the iniquity? What does it say? It says God hates all those who do iniquity. It is not sin that God will one day cast into hell. It is the sinner that God will one day cast into hell. Now when you read that, you say, well, what about, what about John 3.16? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. And the world is full of sinners. So what about John 3.16? 
John 3.16 is in the Bible and it's true. But so is Psalms 5. Do you see that? So is Psalms 5. And the question with regard to good doctrine and theology is how do we balance out the two ideas without ignoring one of them? And isn't it always amazing how we don't ignore the passages on love, but we always ignore the passages on judgment? It clearly teaches throughout the Scriptures in various places that God's hatred is kindled against the wicked. Now that's what it says. Now before I go on to explain that, let me take a step back. I was preaching many, many years ago, and I'll never forget this. I had preached that night on the holiness of God. And when I came down from the pulpit, I went towards the back. Three ministers were waiting for me there, and they were very angry. And this is what they said. They said, we got a real problem with you, Brother Washer. And I said, well, what is it? They said, you're imbalanced. I said, in what way? said, you preached tonight on the holiness of God and not once did you mention the love of God. I said, that's true. That's true. And then I said, were you here last night? And they said, yes. I said, last night I preached the entire night on the love of God and not once did I mention His holiness and none of you three men had a problem with that. I think you're imbalanced. I think you've got a problem. Do you see? Isn't it always amazing that the preacher is never, never rebuked for preaching too much about love? But if he even mentions doctrines that are clearly laid out in Scripture but forgotten and no longer taught, yet a part of historical Christianity, and more important, biblical Christianity, if he does that, people think he's, he's some sort of a vague, some sort of a vile rogue. Yes, John 3.16 is in the Bible. God loves the world. Yes, Psalms 5.5 is in the Bible and God hates all those who do iniquity. I think the NIV has it. God hates all those who do wrong. Now, what are you going to do with that? Well, the greatest theologians down through the ages who've wrestled with this, I think, I would agree with this scenario. When God sees the evil of men outside of Christ, when God sees that evil, His hatred, His wrath, His anger against them is kindled and ready to be poured out. And it's like this, but mercy intercedes. And with one hand, mercy holds back the wrath and hatred of God against the sinner. And with the other hand, God's mercy beckons the sinner to come. But make no mistake about it, and if you deny this doctrine, you are not Christian. One day, one day, for every man, mercy will withdraw its offer. And mercy will withdraw its hand and no longer restrain God's hatred. And at that moment, for you, sir, Outside of Christ, the only thing that will be left for you is the holy hatred of God and His wrath being poured out upon you throughout all of eternity. That is biblical doctrine. So this is what we see. That it is the mercies and the kindnesses of God to all men that restrain His wrath and beckon for all men to come. And yet there will be a point in each individual life and in the macrocosm of human history, there will be a point where God's hand of mercy withdraws the offer. It's all throughout the book of Revelation. Withdraws the offer. And God's hand of mercy no longer restrains His wrath. And there's nothing left for the sinner but the perfect, holy hatred of of God against evil. So when I walk up to a pedophile who has destroyed the lives of countless children, I do not say, God loves you just as you are. What do I say? I say, sir, the mercies of God have been revealed to you and that you still draw breath. And while you draw breath, 
There is hope of salvation, for there is a Lamb who has died for your vile crimes. But if you continue rejecting that, know this, sir, you will suffer eternal punishment in hell for every crime you've ever committed. You know, sometimes we must always use biblical language, but sometimes preachers must go in some sense, beyond biblical language. You say, what do you mean? If I walk up to most people on the street and say, you are a sinner, many of them won't take me serious, will they? They even laugh, won't they? Well, what if I changed the word and I said, sir, you're evil. Because that's what it means. As a matter of fact, to say someone is a sinner is far beyond saying they are evil. It is evil in the grossest degree. We can't understand this, I know. Because we're so far away from a biblical understanding of God. Let me put it to you bluntly. If you're outside of Christ on the day of judgment, when you take your first step into hell, the last thing you will hear is all of creation standing to its feet and praising God because He has rid the earth of you. Have you ever wondered, this is often brought up, well, how will mothers and fathers take it on that day when they see their their grown children judged and thrown into hell? How will they bear that? Would you like the answer? Here's something you need to understand. Men are radically depraved. Men are totally depraved. Let me put it this way. Do you think that Hitler was an anomaly? A phenomenon? No. Every one of us here would make Hitler look like a choir boy except for the restraining grace of God that restrains our evil. And the reason why God restrains the evil of evil men, even those outside of Christ, is so that human civilization might continue to exist so that He might do a work of redemption for His Son. Because if God were to simply remove the restraints from all men on this planet, we would consume ourselves in a matter of a couple of days. And there would be no work of redemption to behold. And that child, you need to understand this. Everything you love about that teenager, that grown son that's outside of Christ, everything you see that you appreciate, that you hold dear, is simply a manifestation of the common grace of God restraining the evil of that person. But on the day of judgment, there will be no restraining grace. And your children will stand before you exactly as they are apart from the grace of God. And what you will see are monsters who would slay you where you stand. That is why even on the day of judgment, parents will lift their hands to heaven and swear that the God of all the earth has done right in the judgment of their own children. What do you think this gospel thing is? What do you think this Christianity thing is? It's some little toy, some little patch, some little silly idea that gives some sort of consolation to brutish people. When the Bible says we're sinners, do you think that just means that we're misunderstood? When we see crimes that are committed that are unspeakable, you think they're beyond you. You need to understand what we are. And when you understand what we are, you will marvel at the fact that God would send His Son to die for the likes of us. That is why oftentimes you'll see the greatest zeal for Christ in the life of the ex-murderer, the life of the ex-prostitute or drug addict. Why? They've seen something of what they are. 
All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all, all would stand condemned apart from God's work of grace in Jesus Christ. Let me go on to say this. I was listening to the radio the other day at home and I was talking about marriage, same-sex marriage, and the Constitution of the United States and said the Founding Fathers could never have, and these were secular people, would of course never even imagined that such a thing could have even possibly exist. They would have never imagined it. But here is the language that was used. But we now today in the 21st century have other sensibilities. And I was immediately taken to Ephesians 4 where it talks about us as a human, as a society, losing all sensibility and becoming calloused. Or when the Bible thinks about, speaks about not even being able to mention because it's unspeakable the things that they do. Do you think that Western culture is going to be judged because of all of its sin? Do you believe that? Well, you're wrong. What do I mean? You need to read Romans 1 correctly. When you see all the sins that are in Romans 1, even to the end of the chapter, and you say, ah, those sins now are found in our society. That means that God's going to judge our society one day because these sins are so prevalent now. No, that's not what the text is saying. The text is saying this, if you look at a society and you see those sins are prevalent, it means that God's already judged your society. And how he has He judged it? He's judged it in this. Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. Therefore, in judgment, He turned them over to do the evil in their own heart and these sins are committed. So if these sins are already prevalent in your society, it's not because God is going to judge you. He already has. It's already, the bell has already tolled. The society of the West is doomed. God will still convert people God will still save people out. He will still have His remnant. But what you have witnessed, and what I have witnessed in my life now, is the death of the West by God's hand. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When you read that now, you'll think about it in a different way, won't you? You'll see, this is not a game. This is not a game. Now, in verse 24, speaking about the Christian, he says, being justified. Talking about those in Christ, he now changes the course of what he's saying. And here we get to the good news. Being justified. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Get it down that the word here is a legal or forensic term. You must understand it in this way, or its consequences are preposterous. It is a legal or forensic term. Now, what do I mean by that? The moment a person places their faith in God, in Christ, God legally declares that person to be right with Him. Do you understand me? Justification does not mean that the moment a person believes in Jesus, they become a perfectly righteous being or that they're infused with grace so that they never sin again. That is not what it's teaching. It is a legal term. It is this idea. The moment you believe God, God declares you to be right with Him. Now, many of you have heard that over and over and over, but I want to add a term, I want to add a phrase that if you don't understand this, you can't understand Calvary. And that's why we're laboring this point so much. The moment a person believes saving faith in God, God declares them right with Him and He treats that person as right with Him. He treats that person. That word treat, keep that in the back of your mind. He treats that person as right with Him. And that is such good news for the Christian. 
You will never be more righteous before God legally than you are right now. Your position before God in Christ is that of absolute righteousness. You are right with God. You see, with God, remember, He is impeccable. He is without sin. He is pure. You can't be a little bit right with God or a little bit wrong with God. You've either got to be perfectly right with God or you're completely wrong with God. But the moment you place your faith in Christ, God legally declares you to be right with Him and then He treats you as right with Him. So that even when He disciplines His children, He does so as a father and not as a judge judicially. You've moved into a completely different realm. And that's what Romans 5 and 6 is about. You've moved now into a completely different realm. Before, you were in Adam, which was sin, law, condemnation, and death. Now you are in Christ justification, righteousness, and life. Okay, now look what it says. It says, for being justified as a gift by His grace. Now, I want you to think about this. Paul seems to be rather redundant here. It's almost as though he's saying, you were justified as a gift, as a gift, as a gift, as a gift, as a gift. Now, the word here, as, or the phrase, as a gift, is translated from the Greek word dorian. That word is used somewhere else, specifically when it's talking about the Messiah in the book of John, and it says they hated Him without a cause. They hated me without a cause. Dorian, they hated me without a cause. Now, when you take that and look at Romans 23-24, what is it saying? Being justified without a cause. And what does that mean? You never gave God a cause or reason to justify you. Do you see that? You and I only gave God a reason or a cause to condemn us. He justified us and He did so in a way that was alien to us. He did so in a way that had nothing to do with you. He did not justify you because of you. He justified you in spite of you. It's grace. Now that comes down to this. If you ever take a contemporary religion class with me, it's really easy. I know know, there's multitudes and hundreds and thousands of religions in the world. No, there's not. There's really not. There's only two. Really, there's only two religions in the whole world. And what are they? There's Christianity, which is a religion of grace. And there's all the other religions of the world can be rolled up under this category, religions of works. Every one of them. Every one. That's what's unique to Christianity. And what's so surprising and so manifest, the evil of men that they would hate with the utmost hatred, the one religion that is free, that is a gift. They hate it. Why? Because it exalts God and debases man. But if I were to stand up here and I was a reporter and I had an Orthodox Jew and a Muslim and a real Christian, I mean a real one. And, I, and as the reporter, a secular man, I said to the, the The Muslim, I said, sir, if you died right now, where would you go? And let's say he said, I would go to paradise. And I go, well, why would you go to paradise? And he says, well, the five pillars I've completed. I've given alms to the poor. I've made the pilgrimages. I've said the daily prayers. I am a righteous man. Well, as a secular reporter, thinking logically, I go, well, that makes sense. He's going to heaven because he earned it. I mean, God owes him. He did it. He's a good man. I go to the Orthodox Jew and I say, if you died right now, where would you go? Well, I would go, into the, I'd go to paradise. Why? Because I love the Torah. I love the law of God. I, I, I love God's righteousness, His law, His word. As a secular man, I look at that and I say, logical? He earned it. God owes him. I go to the Christian, the real Christian. And I say, if you died right now, where would you go? And he said, I'd go to heaven. Why? And he says this, I was born in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I have broken every law of my God, and I deserve judgment and condemnation. 
And as a reporter, I look at that and I go, sir, this is rather awkward. The other two I understand. But you're telling me that you're, they're going to heaven because, well, they, they earned it. You tell me you're going to heaven even though you deserve the very opposite. Sir, how are you going to heaven? And the Christian says, I'm going to heaven based upon the virtue and the merit of another, Jesus Christ my Lord. That's why the Christian is the only person who can actually say he's going to heaven and not be boasting. They can say he's going to heaven and at the same time humble himself because it is not by his own merit or virtue. Now, I am not teaching, as I will later demonstrate, especially tomorrow, that the true Christian lives like the devil and goes to heaven. Because the same God who justifies also regenerates. The doctrine of regeneration. You see, man only has two problems. The condemnation of sin and the power of sin. Through justification, God puts away the condemnation of sin and through regeneration, He puts away the power of sin so that those who have truly been justified have been regenerated and are able to walk in newness of life, bearing fruit and demonstrating that their confession is true. But it is still salvation by grace nonetheless. Now, let's go on being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. I wish I had the quote. There was one old Puritan who would say this, that there are some words that should not be mentioned except with a trembling lip. Redemption is one of those words. Redemption. What does it mean? It's to purchase something. Purchase a slave, a captive, a prisoner by the making of a payment. Now that in itself is amazing. But really, what adds the amazement to this is the price that was paid. The blood of God's own Son. the blood of God's own Son. There's a video out there and it's kind of growing in popularity and it's well done, but it's bad theology. You see this prisoner represents the sinner and he's chained to a wall. And you see, as the narrator speaking, you see this shadow come toward him. And all you can see is the shadow has its arm raised up and has a whip. And it looks like he's about to beat the, uh, the prisoner to death. But then in this video, all of a sudden, the Son of God, or what is supposed the Son of God, intercedes and puts himself in the middle and takes the lash of the whip in the place of the sinner. And in the film, in the documentary, or whatever it is, the little film, it is the devil that's holding the whip that's about to beat the sinner. And it is the devil who lays the whip across Christ's back to save the sinner from the devil. Well, Origen had a similar problem with his theology. That Christ was a payment paid to the devil to save us from the imprisonment of the devil. Make no mistake, Christ's death saves His people from enslavement to the devil, but not in that way at all. And if you think so, you are in the realm of heresy. It wasn't Satan that had the whip. It was God. It was God. Sometimes people, I ask people, what did God save you from? Well, God saved me from sin. Sin wasn't after you. Let me put it to you this way. God saved you from Himself, by Himself, and for Himself. It was God in His righteousness and His holiness that was coming after you. And when Christ interposed, when He stood between you and that judgment, He was standing between you, the sinner, and the judgment of Almighty God. 
on the cross of Calvary. The payment was made to the offended justice of God. And we'll talk about that later. And in satisfying God's judgment, justice, and in appeasing God's wrath, it put an end to the accusations and the power of the devil over us. But make no mistake about it, the price was made, paid by God. And the price was paid to God. And ultimately for the glory of God. Now, let's go on. The redemption which is in Christ Jesus. I came down from the pulpit one time and a young man came up to me and he said, you're right, Brother Paul, Jesus is all we need. I said, young man, that's not what I said. What I said is, Jesus is all we have. Apart from Christ, you have no part with God. Everything that you have of any sort of relationship with God is because you are in Christ. You are in Christ. Christ is the ark. Christ is the ark. Do you see that? And it is only being in the ark that you are saved from the flood of God's wrath. Christ is that city to which the criminal runs, and only inside the walls of that city is the criminal safe. Do you see that? It's in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And outside of Christ, you've nothing. Again, our only boast, our only boast is Christ crucified and raised from the dead on our behalf. Like a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle, you will not go to heaven with one shred of self-righteousness on your back. I know many a good Christian who've gone through perilous times of doubting their salvation. But even the Christians that have gone through those perilous times of doubting their salvation, there was one thing they didn't doubt. And that was this, that if they were saved, it was only in Christ. They are utterly convinced of their absolute inability to add anything to the atoning work of Christ. If it was 99.9% Christ and 0.1% you and I, we would go to hell. But it is all of Christ. All of Christ. Verse 25, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Whom God displayed. Martin Lloyd-Jones uses the word placarded. He placarded Him. There are many tourist areas in the United States where you can't even see the trees for all the signs that are on the side of the road. you, you You can't miss them. God placarded His Son on a cross in the center of the religious universe. To manifest it there. His Son dying on Calvary. God placarded it. He could have done it some other way. In the sense of it could have been something out in the remote areas. But no, in the very center of the religious world, He placards Him. Why? He wants to show us something. This Gospel thing is so much bigger than your and my individual salvation. And you must understand that. Again, our culture, our societies, everything revolves around us, we feel. But it's so much bigger than us, this Gospel. It says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. I remember one time preaching in Michigan, and I was terrified because Vernon Hyam was in the... uh, audience, and I have the greatest respect for him. And I was preaching on propitiation, and I'll never forget, it was the first time I met him, only time I've talked to him. And after the sermon, I said, he came toward me. I got, oh gosh, what did I say wrong, you know? And he had his Bible open, and I don't, I don't know exactly what translation he was talking about, but he goes, 
we got it back in the book. We got it back in the book. And I said, what? Propitiation. We got it back in our book. I guess there was some fight over translations or something. This word is so important. So important. I was pre speaking to a, a pastor a while back, and this is what he said. I don't care if my church members can define all these words and things. I just want them to live for Jesus. I thought, you fool. I had a much larger word in mind, but I thought I'd be a gentleman that day. You don't want them to understand the words. How can we serve Christ if we don't understand the words? How can we believe Christ if we don't understand the words? Because the only way we can know whether or not we have the true Christ is by understanding the words of Christ. I saw a film the other day and they wanted to use one of my sermons and we had to turn them down because as I was going through there, I thought, this young man has got all these experts up on this panel and every one of them have a different definition of Christ and salvation. It was a hodgepodge of nothing. There are countless Christs out there today. And mark my words, young people, you are going to live in a time of evangelicalism where evangelicalism means nothing. When Martin Lloyd-Jones and others were around coining that phrase and promoting that phrase, it meant something. It means nothing. Most evangelicals today don't have a clue who God is. Because of this idea, we don't need to understand the words. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And one of the most important words, if not the most important word in Scripture other than the names of God, is propitiation. It is a sacrifice that satisfies the demands of God's justice and makes it possible for a just God to forgive wicked men while maintaining His justice. You must understand this. Now let me give you what I call the divine dilemma. What is the Bible all about? I mean, from Genesis to the end, the law, the prophets, what's really going on? If you had to summarize it in one, st one concept, it would be this. There is a divine dilemma. There is a problem, which we find it very hard to grasp today because we know nothing about righteousness. What is that problem? Let me put it this way. If God is just, He cannot forgive you. The greatest problem in all the Bible is how can God be just and at the same time justify wicked men? That is the greatest problem in the Bible. If God condemned all of mankind to hell, there would be no need for a theological, philosophical explanation. It is when God spares the sinner that there's some explaining to do. How can God be just and at the same time pardon wicked men? That's what the Bible is all about. Let me show you the problem. Look, look for a moment. Go back to Exodus. Look at Exodus 34. Here we have probably the greatest revelation of God in the Old Testament other than maybe Isaiah chapter 6. At least the most graphic, picturesque, powerful. In, in Exodus 34, verse 6, Then the Lord passed by in front of him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. It's sort of a Hebrew parallelism, parallelism here. It's heaping one term upon another to say God forgives all types and kinds of sin. But now comes the problem. Listen to what he says. Who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Does anyone see a problem there? How do you forgive... All iniquity, 
transgression and sin. You say that. Who forgives all types and kinds of sin, yet will not let the guilty go unpunished. How do you do both of those things? How do you forgive sinners and yet there's not one sinner who will go unpunished? How do you do that? Look for a moment at Proverbs 15. Or Proverbs 17, verse 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Abomination is probably the strongest word in the Hebrew text. It's something that's loathsome, disgusting to God. And here's the question. It says, anyone who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Yet over here in Romans 3, we just read that God justifies the wicked. So how can every... How can it be that if you justify the wicked, it's an abomination to God, and yet God gets praise out of justifying the wicked? Do you see the problem? There's a problem, isn't there? Now, go to Romans. Go to Romans 4. Close to the text where we are right now. Romans 4, look at verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. In our own societies, what do we say when a judge covers sin? Do we praise him for it or do we call him corrupt? We call him corrupt. How does God just cover sin? Act like it's not there. I thought he was holy. How does God do that? God says that anyone justifies the wicked is an abomination to him, but then he turns around and justifies the wicked. God says He forgives all types and kinds of sin, yet anyone who commits sin, they're going to to be punished. God covers sin. And the great question of all the Scripture is this, how can God truly be just and cover sin? How can God truly be just all the while justifying wicked men who rightfully ought to be condemned. That's what this passage is about. How did He do it? He did it in His Son. All men must die and suffer eternally the wrath of God. God becomes a man and lives a perfect life that no man could live. And then He goes to a tree. And on that tree, God imputes the sin of His people upon His Son. And every sin of God's people that day on Calvary was punished. Every sin of mine was punished. Punished as Christ was abandoned of God and crushed under the wrath of His own Father. I'm going to talk about this a lot more in the conference that's to come, the Banner of Truth Conference. The way the gospel is preached today in most places, I would have to say this. If I was just a neutral listener and didn't know anything about the Bible, I would say that somehow, because the Romans beat up Jesus, our sins were paid for. That's the conclusion I would come to. I have heard preachers, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and He cries out, let this cup pass from Me. Let this cup pass from Me. Let this cup pass from Me. I've heard preachers say, in His omniscience, 
Christ looked forward and saw the cat of nine tails coming down upon his back, the crown of thorns on his head, the nails in his hands and his feet, the way the Romans would beat him and the Jews would mock him, and he trembled at the thought of it. Preposterous. Sick is it to say something like that. Listen, after the ascension of Christ, for the next three centuries, countless Christians died on crosses. Some of them crucified upside down, a crude form of kerosene doused upon them and they were set on fire, suffered untold miseries, and yet they went to those crosses doing what? Singing hymns, praising God, and counting it joy to suffer like their Master to at least some degree. And yet the captain of their salvation is hiding in Gethsemane, crying out, let this cup pass from me. Do you really think that? Is your view so low of Christ? So, I don't know, Catholic? Where he's some sort of martyr? When he went into that garden, all hell was loosed upon him. The old Puritans used to say this, that in the wilderness, Satan appeared to him in somewhat of an attractive form to tempt him. But now, now in the garden, he appears to him as he is, the monster of iniquity. All of hell gathered together to leap upon him like ravenous wolves. Already he's beginning to feel the abandonment of his father. Spurgeon said it this way. Now I know he had a, a gift of embellishment at times. But Spurgeon said this. Satan walked up to him and said, You see those disciples? You have failed. God has abandoned you. And you see your little tiny flock over there? They're mine now. And not only that, you had a task to carry out that you did not complete. Not only will I take them, I will empty heaven and cast it into hell because you have failed. Everything came upon him at that moment. But of all the things that came upon him, every aspect of the curse began to fall upon him. Spiritual, physical, everything you could imagine began to fall upon him there in the garden. The weight of our sin. The abandonment of God. But of all of it, the worst was this. He was the Son. God didn't create the world because He had some need. God created the world out of the overflow of His superabundance of the relationship between Himself and the Son. The Father always delighted in the Son. And the Son always delighted in the Father. There was no need of anything else. And yet at that moment, that was going to be broken. He was going to be on that tree, abandoned of God. God's favorable presence removed from Him. And then all the wrath of Almighty God was going to be hurled upon Him and crush Him to pieces. A Roman whip was part of our redemption. It had to be a bloody sacrifice. He had to suffer all the things of the curse. And physical suffering was part of that. But never think it was the end of it. It wasn't even the beginning of it. The pain of the tree is that His own Father crushed Him. Have you never read in Isaiah 53.10, it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. Under the full force of His wrath, all of God's holy hatred against your evil fell upon His Son. My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? You should be forsaken. I should be forsaken. But someone had to die forsaken in our place. You and I should drink the cup. I remember one time I was so astounded. I was teaching at this school. It was a very classical education, reformed education school. It was a marvelous school. And I, told, I was there to address the chapel. And so I got there and I said, well, who's going to be in the chapel? And they said, well, our kindergarten through 12th grade. 
And I said, well, that makes it a little difficult. I'm going to be teaching on propitiation. And the headmaster, she looked at me and she said, Brother Washer, it will be no problem here. And so I, I gave it to him, seminary level, boom. <laughs> and I got to the part of Gethsemane and I said, what was in the cup? And this little nine-year-old girl, I'll never forget, eight or nine years old, she went like this, raised her hand and I said, yes, dear. And in true fashion, she stood at the side of her desk, put her little hand on her desk like that, and she looked at me and she said, Sir, the wrath of Almighty God was in the cup. Most preachers today don't understand that. Do you see what happened there on that tree? His father crushed him. That is the pain of Calvary. All the wrath and holy hatred of God against your evil, my evil, fell on Him. That's the cross. That's what happened there. That's why it's so amazing. Do you realize I could, just out of research, from just the Puritans and the Reformers, Spurgeon, up to Martin Lloyd-Jones, we could have a conference of probably two or three months just on Gethsemane, and we would not even begin to touch the sufferings of our Lord. You see, this is what captivates the heart. This is what controls a man or woman. This is what causes them to be martyred. It is this controlling love of God manifested in the cross of Jesus Christ. You must understand this. You must see it. You must labor all your life in the Scriptures to understand more and more of what God has done for you in Christ. And it was with His death, His death, the great dilemma was solved. How can God be just and the justifier of wicked men? Look in verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Now look, this was to demonstrate His righteousness. Now why would God need to demonstrate that He's righteous. Now, why would He need to publicly give us a public demonstration on Calvary that He's really and truly righteous? Why would He have to do that? It says, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't want to be dramatic here, but let's, just to put it in perspective, let's look at it this way. Let's just imagine for a moment the great accuser, Satan. Just imagine. You see, what you need to understand is that when Satan fell, and we do not know a lot about his fall, we don't know half as much as we write, but we do know he's fallen, he's a personal, angelic, demonic being, and he hates God. Let me just stop here for a little side note. Little children always ask me the wisest questions. And they say, Brother Paul? I say, yeah. Satan's pretty smart, isn't he? Yeah, he's pretty smart. Well, he, he knows a lot about God, right? Yeah, he knows a lot about God. Well, he knows he's going to lose, doesn't he? I mean, he knows. He's got to know that there's no chance of winning. Why doesn't he just stop? It's a good question. It's not childish at all, but it reveals something amazing. He knows he's going to lose. He knows he's going to hell forever. So why doesn't he repent? For the same reason some of you don't repent. He hates God so much, he would rather rot in hell than bow his knee to God. Imagine a political prisoner. He's there in jail and the kind king comes down 
and throws open the prison door and says, you can come free. Go back to your family, everything else. You just have to bow the knee and acknowledge my sovereignty. And the prisoner walks over and slams the prison door and says, I'd rather rot in hell than bow my knee to you. Don't think that in hell you've got a bunch of people repenting and praying for their release. You've got a bunch of people suffering untold misery, but would rather rot in hell than to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. I don't agree with much of what C.S. Lewis said at times, but there's one thing he said that I will agree with it. The door to hell is locked from the inside. That's how much men hate God. And that's how much you and I would hate God if He had not interposed and regenerated us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't even glory in your faith because your faith is a gift. But let's imagine for a moment Satan fell. Perfect justice. Perfect justice. He's condemned with no hope of salvation. Realize this. Angels are a lot more splendid than you and I. They all fell. God did not send them a Savior. He didn't have to send you one either. We take too much for granted. We think we're so special. I even heard one theologian say, if God had not sent His Son, I would be an atheist. As though God owed us something. Tozer was right when he said, if the sun, if all men went blind tomorrow, it would not diminish the glory of the sun or the moon or the stars. And if all men were unbelievers and went straight to hell, it would not diminish the glory of God. It's not dependent upon man's opinion. Nor did He have to send you a Savior or me a Savior. Nor did He have to work in any shape, form, or fashion to bring the Gospel to you. He is God, and you deserve hell, and so do I. And the fact that He's done anything for us is an infinite act of mercy. Now you say, I'm saying things in a hard way. I am. I need to bring the point across because there's so many others saying different things today. Another thing, some of you are hearing things you've never heard before, but if you just read old books, you'd find out every evangelistic sermon that was ever preached a hundred years ago contained the same message. That's why I say I believe Spurgeon is one of the greatest preachers who ever lived. He ought to be because he only preached one sermon. Every time he preached, he got up and preached on the cross. And this was his center point in everything. Adam and Eve fall. Can you imagine the accuser on that day? God, where's your justice? This ball of dirt rebels against you. This worm crawling on the ground. No seraphim here. Dirt. I rebelled against you. I disobeyed you and you cast me out. You give these a promise? Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelicum, the first promise of the Gospel. You give them a promise? One born of woman that will crush my head? They deserve to die. Where's your justice? In the flooding of the world. You say, ah, there was justice. No, God's got some explaining to do. Why? Because Noah should have died too. And Noah's family. They all should have died. They were all sinners. You imagine the devil. And Noah? Noah? How can you spare him? Justice demands his death. Your justice demands his death. Oh, and Abraham? Abraham, your friend, you call him friend? He believed you. He did not. Many times he doubted. He believed the the voice of his wife over you. Oh, and David? You call David your... He's a murderer. And an adulterer. Oh, and Israel, your people? They worshipped Moloch in the desert. They worshipped me. They deserve to die. How can you do this, God? How can you do this? 2,000 years ago, God answered His question. Satan, come forth. Do you want to know 
how I can give a promise to the fallen parents of the human race? Do you want to know how I can save Noah from the flood? You want to know how I can call Abraham my friend? You want to know how I can call David my son? You want to know how I can gather a multitude of people from this sinful race and call them mine? Look now to Calvary, because there is your answer. My son, the Lamb, dies for them all. Do you see that? Everyone who's ever gone to heaven has gone to heaven because of the death of the Lamb and the resurrection of the Lamb. Your faith would do you no good because your faith cannot atone for sin. Your faith must be in an atonement. And that atonement is the person of Christ. He died. He died. One time I was teaching was at Murray State University to a group, Christian group, but there are a lot of secular people in the audience and I was teaching on this and this one young man stood up and to this day I owe him a great debt. He stood up and he goes, I got a question for you. I said, okay. How can one man, one man, die for a multitude of people? And how can he suffer for a few short hours on Calvary and yet redeem a people from eternal suffering in hell? I said, oh young man, Thank you. Here's your answer. Because that one man hanging on the cross is worth more than all of them put together. You see, when theologians talk about the perfections of Christ, they're not just talking about His sinlessness. They're talking about, and get this down in your book, the infinite value of Christ. You take everything that is Mountains and molehills, stars and planets, crickets and clowns and everything that is in this world and you put it on a scale and you put Jesus on the other side and the value of that one man outweighs them all. If David's head was worth more than so many in Israel, how much more the son of David who is also the son of God. It is the value of his sacrifice. The value of it. And he died. He died. You see, holiness springs from this. Dedication and devotion springs from this. Paul said it himself, one man died, we all died. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him who died for us. He died. But not only did he die, he rose again from the dead on the third day. You have not preached the gospel if you have not preached the resurrection. As a matter of fact, the book of Acts is a tremendous rebuke even to those of us who take the gospel quite seriously. The resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ is a priority in that book. This one who died rose again from the dead. And if you look at Romans 4, and you go over to verse 25. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. It is a very difficult text to interpret. It's a very difficult text to translate from the original. But the meaning, according to almost all Orthodox commentaries, and that I, the meaning that I would put to this, he was delivered over because of our justification and was raised because His death obtained our justification. He was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because that death that He died, it truly paid. The resurrection is proof that God accepted the death of Jesus Christ as total payment for our sin. Now believer, listen to me. This is so important. Most people don't get this. Remember what I said, the moment you believe in Jesus, God legally declares you to be right with Him and treats you as right with Him. On the cross of Calvary, God legally declared His Son to be guilty 
and treated him as guilty and poured out the full force of his wrath upon him. But right before he died, Christ cried out, it is finished. It's paid in full. There's nothing else to pay. Now, in the United States, when a very important person is about to leave office, whether it be a governor, president, at times they will pardon a criminal. Many of those criminals who are pardoned live the rest of their life in misery. Do you know why? They're still guilty. The crime is still outstanding. They're guilty. They are guilty. And I have heard preachers use that, you know, that pardoning of criminals by a governor or president as an illustration of what God has done. That's not true. When the governor or president pardons a criminal, that crime is still outstanding. It's not been paid for. Do you see that? And the man still bears the guilt. He still has a defiled conscience. That is not the Christian. Christ paid. That is why Paul could have a clean conscience. That's why we are freed from guilt. We are not just pardoned criminals that still have a guilt outsta- uh, a debt outstanding that's not been paid. It's been paid. It's removed from the books. It's no longer there. We're free. We're free. It's gone. Because of that payment and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof of that. He was raised. Then if we had time, we could go on and maybe I'll just address a few more things here. Not only was He raised, He ascended. Now, so many people at times, they look at, for example, John 17 and the high priestly prayer and other places where Jesus talks about you know, going back to having the glory that He had before. And then they look at Philippians chapter 2 and they say, well, you know, He's been raised, you know, His name above every name at His name. But how really is Christ rewarded? If He's going back to the reward He had before, what what does all that mean? Here's something that you need to understand. The one who was raised was God. He was God in the flesh. And we emphasize His deity, and rightly so, because His deity is usually attacked the most. But here's something we got to be careful of, that we don't lose the humanity. He was raised the man, Christ Jesus. God and man. And the one who ascended up, the one who ascended up and now represents us before God is our own flesh. He is flesh of our flesh. He is bone of our bone. He is Christ Jesus the man. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Paul isn't denying his humanity, but what Paul is isn't denying his deity, but what Paul is doing is emphasizing his humanity. The one who now sits upon the very throne of the universe is our elder brother. Flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, man exalted, as we see in Hebrews. A lot of the ancients, and I'm going to go to it um, just for the sake of maybe representing something of the glory. Go for a moment to Psalms 24. This is the Ascension Psalm. It was used of course, in Israel. But it was also throughout the history of commentaries and the Puritans and the Reformers, they took this Ascension Psalm also as a reference to Christ. Spurgeon, as a matter of fact, has a wonderful sermon on this text. We get to verse 7. This is what Spurgeon and many of his beloved Puritan said, Christ the man has been raised in glory. And now, 40 days have passed and He ascends up to the gates of heaven. And there He stands, the man, Christ Jesus, for us, for His people. 
And he cries out to the gates of heaven and says in verse 7, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, old ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. But all of heaven is in a rattle. Angels run to the wall and climb over to look over the parapet because they're all astonished. Who is this man? No one has ever come this far. No one has dared laid his hand to the latch of the gates of glory. Who is this man that now stands here so boldly and commands the gates to be open? And in verse 8, the angels cry out, Who is this King of glory? And then Jesus, with a mighty voice, declares the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, old ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And for the first time in all of time, a man, the Son of Man, yes, God the Son, yes, the Son of God, but man, the man for us, our representative, the second Adam, the last Adam, he walks into heaven by virtue of his own virtue and his own merit. And unlike Esther, waiting for Xerxes to extend the golden scepter to know whether or not she's accepted, this man needs no such waiting. He knows he's accepted. And by his own right, he ascends the steps of the throne of God and sits down at his right hand. King of kings, Lord of lords, our brother. And according to the writer of Hebrews, because of the power of His atonement, He's not ashamed to call us brethren. And know this. I know, especially for you young Christians, and we'll bring this to an end. Young Christians, I know you look at the world. And even for me, now 54 years old, seen so many changes, and everyone, all these Christians running around so scattered saying, oh, the world's falling apart, and, and the morality, and the persecution's coming, and the church is languishing, and all these things are going on, and it's all just in confusion and disarray. It is absolutely not in disarray. It is exactly like our Master is planning it. The world is not falling apart. He's directing it in every way for His glory. And this Jesus who died, and this Jesus who rose again, and this Jesus who ascended will one day return. And when He returns, He will be known to His people, but He will be unknown to so many who call themselves evangelical. Because when they look there, they will see nothing but a great King. A great king. A face full of fire. Coming in judgment. And he will rule over the nations. And know this, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Some will bow and some will confess because of grace, because of salvation. Others will bow, as R.C. Sproul said, because their kneecaps have been broken by the one who rules the nations with a rod of iron. A politically correct Jesus is not returning. But the King of kings and Lord of lords. I love what Abraham Kuyper said, the old Dutch theologian. He said when Christ returns, he said he'll extend forth his hand and he'll say this, mine, 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 mine. It's all mine. And I'm taking it back. Don't look for this pathetic version of Christ that is portrayed in so many evangelical pulpits. Look for Christ's victor. Christ's champion. Christ who will save His people and come with unspeakable fury against even the kings and the greatest men of this earth. That's why they're admonished in the book of Psalms to now, chapter 2, kiss the Son while there is still chance of reconciliation because His anger flares up quickly. And know this, if you're here today and you've got just enough religion to kill your conscience, you're in a horrid state. You're in the most dangerous state. If you're raised by godly parents and you think that your ability to memorize Scripture has somehow made you right with God, you are in a dangerous state. If you think you're saved because one time you prayed a prayer and asked Jesus Christ in your heart, you are in a dangerous state. 
How many have repeated that useless creed and are still lost in going to hell? You're not saved by repeating a prayer. You are saved by repenting of your sins and believing the gospel. And the evidence that you have truly repented unto salvation is that you continue repenting. And the evidence that you believed at one time unto salvation is you are still believing and bearing fruit and growing and being disciplined and being as one of His. And if these things aren't found in your life, then your faith is useless. It is not saving faith. Repent and believe the Gospel. Throw yourself on Christ. Throw yourself on Christ. And if you're hoping in Christ plus something else, you are not Christian. You're not. But if Christ is your only hope, And Christ is your only boast. And Christ is the growing love. Then there's hope. Make your calling and election, sure. Do you know Him? More importantly, does He know you? For He says, many will come before me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Do you know Him? Are you believing Him? Are you rolling upon Christ, resting upon Christ? Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word and for Your Gospel. And I pray that You would help Your people, Lord. Help them. In Jesus' name, Amen.